Advice by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. I must do as you do. Your own way, I own, is a very good way. And still, there are sometimes two straight roads to a town, one over, one under the hill. You are treading the safe and the well-worn way that the prudent choose each time. And you think me reckless and rash today because I prefer to climb? Your path is the right one, and so is mine. We are not like peas in a pod, compelled to lie in a certain line, or else be scattered abroad. Twere a dull old world, methinks, my friend, if we all went just one way. Yet our paths will meet, no doubt, at the end, though they lead apart today. You like the shade, and I like the sun. You like an even pace. I like to mix with the crowd and run, and then rest after the race. I like danger and storm and strife. You like a peaceful time. I like the passion and surge of life. You like its gentle rhyme. You like buttercups, dewy, sweet, and crocuses framed in snow. I like roses born of the heat and the red carnations glow. I must live my life, not yours, my friend, for so it was written down. We must follow our given paths to the end, but I trust we shall meet in town. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Birds Will Sing Again by John O'Brien Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson she saw the helper standing near when grief and care oppressed. A great big God who wiped the tear and soothed the aching breast. So in the stress of sorrows piled, the gloom was lifted when she pointed up and sweetly smiled. A great big God, be brave, my child. The birds will sing again. When dark misfortune hovering o'er brought woes on every hand, and care was camping by the door, and drought was on the land. When lingering hope in rags was clad, her faith shone brightest then. A great big God, so cheer up, Dad. Don't mope about and take it bad. The birds will sing again. And always some soft silver ray athwart the gloom would burst to chase the heavy clouds away. When things were at their worst, her great big God would justify the trembling trust of men. For when the cheerless night passed by, the sun would wink his golden eye, and birds would sing again. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Broken Love by William Blake, 1757 to 1827. Read for LibriVox.org Broken Love My spectre round me night and day Like a wild beast guards my way My emanation far within Weeps incessantly for my sin A fathomless and boundless deep There we wander, there we weep On the hungry craving wind My spectre follows thee behind he scents thy footsteps in the snow, wheresoever thou dost go. Through the wintry hail and rain, when wilt thou return again? Poor, pale, pitiable form that I follow in a storm, from sin I never shall be free till thou forgive and come to me. A deep winter dark and cold within my heart thou dost unfold, Iron tears and groans of lead thou bindest around my aching head. 
dost thou not in pride and scorn fill with tempests all my morn and with jealousies and fears and fill my pleasant nights with tears o'er my sins thou dost sit and moan hast thou no sins of thine own o'er my sins thou dost sit and weep and lull thine own sins fast asleep thy weeping thou shalt ne'er give o'er i sin against thee more and more and never will from sin be free till thou forgive and come to me what transgressions i commit are for thy transgressions fit they thy harlots thou their slave and my bed becomes their grave seven of my sweet loves thy knife hath bereaved of their life their marble tombs i built with tears and with cold and shadowy fears seven more loves weep night and day round the tombs where my loves lay and seven more loves attend at night around my couch with torches bright and seven more loves in my bed crown with thine my mournful head pitying and forgiving all thy transgressions great and small when wilt thou return and view my loves and them in life renew when wilt thou return and live when wilt thou pity as i forgive throughout all eternity i forgive you you forgive me as our dear redeemer said this the wine and this the bread end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Dancing Girl by James Weldon Johnson Read for LibriVox.org by Daryl Nobles From Dawn by the Carib Sea Do you know what it is to dance? Perhaps you do know in a fashion. But by dancing I mean not what's generally seen, but dancing of fire and passion. A fire and delirious passion with a dusky-haired senorita, her dark misty eyes near your own, and her scarlet-red mouth like a rose of the south, the reddest that ever was grown, so close that you catch her quick panting breath as across your own face it is blown, with a sigh and a moan, ah, that is dancing, as here by the care of its known. Now whirling and twirling like furies we go, now soft and caressing and sinuously slow, with an undulating motion like waves on a breeze-kissed ocean, and the scarlet-red mouth is nearer your own, and the dark misty eyes still softer have grown. Ah, that is dancing, that is loving, as here by the care of their known. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Darkling Thrush by Thomas Hardy Read for LibriVox.org by N. R. Collard I leant upon a coppice gate When frost was spectre grey And winter's dregs made desolate The weakening eye of day The tangled bind stems scored the sky Like strings of broken lyres And all mankind that haunted nigh Had sought their household fires The land's sharp features seemed to me The sentry's corpse Outlent, its crypt the cloudy canopy, the wind its death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth was shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. At once a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead, in a full hearted even song of joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, with blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things afar or nigh around. That I could think there trembled through his happy good night air some blessed hope whereof he knew 
and I was unaware. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Eve's Intercession, Cadman's Metrical Paraphrase of Parts of the Holy Scriptures by Cadman, 657-684 to Translated by Benjamin Thorpe, 1782-1870 to Published in 1832 Read for LibriVox.org Excerpt from Book 2, Section 8 The angel race was erst named Lucifer, called light-bearing in former days in God's kingdom. Then he in his glory raised strife that he preeminences might possess. Satan darkly sought that he might in heaven a throne establish above the eternal. That was their chief, the author of evil. He ruled it afterwards when he to hell must sink and his crew with him fall into the preserver's hate and from henceforth that they might not on the eternal look for evermore then dread came over them at the thunder before their judge when he the doors of hell break and bent bliss was to men when they thy saviour's visage saw then was to that fell one whom we e'er named then with dread were all affrightened wide through the windy hall moaned in words this is awful now hath this storm overwhelmed chieftain and followers it is the lord of angels before him goeth a fairer light than we ever e'er saw with eyes save when we with angels were on high now will he our torments through his glory's power all dissipate now this dread hath come thunder before the lord must this dreary band suddenly now suffer terror it is he himself the powerful son the lord of angels he will up from hence lead souls and we ever after for this work of wrath shall suffer punishment went then to hell for the children of men the lord through his might he would of men a number many thousands lead forth up to their heavenly country then came the sound of angels thunder at dawn the lord himself had the enemy overcome the warfare was as yet open at early morn then the terror seized them he let then ascend the blessed souls the race of adam but eve might not as yet on glory look ere she said in words i alone angered thee lord eternal when we too adam and i of the apple ate through the serpent's malice as we should not taught us the baleful one he who ever now shall burn in bonds that we might bliss and joy a holy home heaven in our power then we the accursed's words believed took with our hands on the holy tree the bright fruit for this he bitterly requited us when we into his hot den were forced to go and a number of winters dwell there afterwards many thousands severely burned now i beseech thee guardian of heaven's kingdom by the train that thou hast hither led hosts of angels that i up from hence can and may with my kindred and after three nights came the saviour's minister home to hell is now firm in bonds with torments weary as if with him the king of glory for his presumption hath been wroth thou saidest to us in sooth that god himself would to hell's inhabitants home descend arose then every one and on his arm rested leaned on his hands through hell's horror dreadful seemed they were all for this glad in their sufferings that their lord would for their help seek hell end of excerpt this recording is in the public domain.
Fifty Years by James Weldon Johnson. Read for LibriVox.org by Daryl Nobles. O oh, brothers mine, today we stand where half a century sweeps our kin. Since God through Lincoln's ready hand struck off our bonds and made us men. Just fifty years a winter's day as runs the history of a race. Yet as we look back o'er the way, how distant seems our starting place. Look farther back, three centuries, to where a naked, shivering score, snatched from their haunts across the seas, stood wild-eyed on Virginia's shore, far, far the way that we have trod, far from heathen crawls and jungle dens, to freedmen's, freemen, sons of God, Americans and citizens. As part of his unknown designs, we've lived within a mighty age, and we have helped to write a line on history's most wondrous page. A few black bondmen strewn along the borders of our eastern coast, now grown a race ten million strong, an upward, onward marching host. Then let us here erect a stone to mark the place to mark the time, a witness to God's mercies shown, a pledge to hold this day sublime. And let that stone an altar be, where on thanksgiving we may lay, where we in deep humility, for faith and strength renewed, may pray. With open hearts ask from above, new zeal, new courage, and new powers, that we may grow more worthy of this country and this land of ours. For never let the thought arise that we are here on suffrage bare, outcast, asylum, neath these skies, and aliens without part or share. This land is ours by right of birth. This land is ours by right of toil. We help to turn its virgin earth our sweat is in its fruitful soil, where once the tangled forest stood, where flourished once rank weed and thorn. Behold the path trace peaceful wood, the cotton white, the yellow corn, to gain these fruits that have been earned, to hold these fields that have been won. Our arms have strained, our backs have burned, bent bare beneath a ruthless sun. That banner which is now the type of victory on field and flood. Remember its first crimson stripe was dyed by Attucks willing blood. And never yet has come the cry when that fair flag has been assailed. For men to do, for men to die, that have we faltered or have failed? We've helped to bear it, rent and torn. Through many a hot-breathed battle breeze, Held in our hands, it has been born, And planted far across the sea. And never yet, O haughty land, Let us at least for this be praised. Has one black, treason-guided hand Ever against that flag been raised? Then should we speak but serve our words, Or shall we hang our heads in shame? Stand back of new come foreign hordes and fear our heritage to claim? No, stand erect and without fear. And for our foes, let this suffice. We've brought a rightful sonship here, and we have more than paid the price. And yet, my brothers, will I know? The tethered feet, the pinion wings, the spirit bowed beneath the blow. The heart grown faint with wounds and stings, The staggering force of brutish might That strikes and leaves us stunned and dazed, The long vein wading through the night To hear some voice for justice raised. Full well I know the hour when hope Sinks dead and round us everywhere, Hangs stifling darkness and we grope, With hands uplifted in despair. Courage! Look out, beyond and see, the far horizon's beckoning span. Faith in our God-known destiny, 
we are a part of some great plan. Because the tongues of Garrison and Phillips now are cold in death, think you their work can be undone or quench the fires lit by their breath? Think you that John Brown's spirit stops, that Lovejoy was but idly slain? Or do you think those precious drops from Lincoln's heart was shed in vain, that for which millions prayed and sighed, that for which tens of thousands fought, for which so many freely died, God cannot let it come to naught? James Weldon Johnson End of poem this recording is in the public domain. To the Forgotten Dead by Margaret Louisa Woods Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk To the Forgotten Dead Come, let us drink in silence ere we part To every fervent yet resolved heart that brought its tameless passion and its tears renunciation and laborious years to lay the deep foundations of our race to rear its mighty ramparts overhead and light its pinnacles with golden grace to the unhonored dead to the forgotten dead whose dauntless hands were stretched to grasp the reign of fate and hurl into the void again her thunder-hoofed horses rushing blind earthward along the courses of the wind among the stars along the wind in vain their souls were scattered and their blood was shed and nothing nothing of them doth remain to the thrice perished dead End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. From Contemplations by Anne Bradstreet. Read for LibriVox.org by Sabiha. When I behold the heavens as in their prime, and then the earth, though old, still clad in green, the stones and trees insensible of time nor age nor wrinkle on their front are seen if winter come and greenness then doth fade a spring returns and there more youthful made but man grows old lies down remains where once he's laid by birth more noble than those creatures all yet seems by nature and by custom cursed no sooner born but grief and care make fall that state obliterate he had at first nor youth nor strength nor wisdom spring again nor habitations long their names retain but in oblivion to the final day remain. Shall I then praise the heavens, the trees, the earth, because their beauty and their strength last longer? Shall I wish there or never to had birth, because they are bigger and their bodies stronger? Nay, they shall darken, perish, fade, and die. And when unmade, so ever shall they lie, but man was made for endless immortality. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gaudiamus Igatur by Margaret Louisa Woods Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Gachuk. Come no more of grief and dying, Sing the time too swiftly flying, Just an hour, youth's in flower, Give me roses to remember, In the shadow of December. 
fie on steeds with leaden paces winds shall bear us on our races speed o oh speed wind my steed beat the lightning for your master yet my fancy shall fly faster give me music give me rapture youth that's fled can none recapture not with thought wisdom's bought out on pride and scorn and sadness give me laughter give me gladness sweetest earth i love and love thee seas about thee skies above thee sun and storms hues and forms of the clouds with floating shadows on thy mountains and thy meadows earth there's none that can enslave thee not thy lords it is that have thee not for gold art thou sold but thy lovers at their pleasure take thy beauty and thy treasure while sweet fancies meet me singing while the april blood is springing in my breast while a jest and my youth thou yet must leave me fortune tis not thou canst grieve me when at length the grasses cover me the world's unwearied lover if regret haunt me yet it shall be for joys untasted nature lent and folly wasted youth and jests and summer weather goods that kings and clowns together waste or use as they choose these the best we miss pursuing sullen shades that mock our wooing feigning age will not delay it when the reckoning comes we'll pay it own our mirth has been worth all the forfeit light or heavy wintry time and fortune levy feigning grief will not escape it what though ne'er so well you ape it age and care all must share all alike must pay hereafter some for sighs and some for laughter know ye sons of melancholy to be young and wise is folly tis the weak fear to wreak on this clay of life their fancies shaping battles shaping dances while ye scorn our names unspoken roses dead and garlands broken o ye wise we arise out of failures dreams disasters we arise to be your masters End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Grave of Keats by Silas Weir Mitchell. Read for LibriVox.org by Arden. May 5th. The Grave of Keats. The Protestant Cemetery at Rome. Here lies one whose name was written water. Fair little city of the pilgrim dead. Dear are thy marble streets, thy rosy lanes. Easy it seems and natural here to die, And doth a mother who, with tender care, Doth lay to sleep her ailing little ones. Old are these graves, and they who mournfully Saw dust to dust return, themselves are mourned. Yet in green cloisters of the cypress shade, Full choir chants the fearless nightingale, Ancestral songs learn when the world was young. Sing on, sing ever in thy breezy homes, Toss earthward from the white acacia bloom, The mingled joy of fragrance and of song. Sing in the pure security of bliss. These dead concern thee not, nor thee the fear, That is the shadow of our earthly loves. And me thou canst not comfort, tender hearts, Inherit here the anguish of the doubt, Writ on this gravestone, he at last I trust, Serenity of sure attainment knows. The night falls and the darkened verdure starred, what pallid roses shuts the world away? Sad wandering souls of song, frail ghosts of thought, That voiceless died, the massing shadows haunt, Troubling the heart with unfulfilled delight. The moon is listening in the vault of heaven, 
and like the airy march of mighty wings, the rhythmic throb of stately cadences enthralls the ear with some high-measured verse, where ecstasies of passion nurtured words for great thoughts find a home and fill the mind with echoes of divinely purposed hopes that war on earth the death pall of despair. Night darkens round me, never more in life. May I, companioned by the friendly dead, walk in this sacred fellowship again. Therefore thou silent singer neath the grass, still sing to me those sweeter songs unsung, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone, caressing thought with wonderments of phrase, such as thy springtide rapture knew to win. I sing to me thy unborn summer songs, and the ripe autumn lays that might have been, strong wine of fruit mature, whose flowers alone we know. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. He Goads Himself by Lewis Untermeyer Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp And was it I that hoped to rattle a broken lance against iron laws? Was it I that asked to go down in battle for a lost cause? Fool! Must there be new deaths to cry for when only rottenness survives? Here are enough lost causes to die for through twenty lives. What have we learned? That the familiar lusts are the only things that endure? That for an age grown blinder and sillier there is no cure? And man, free of one kind of fetter, he runs to gaudier shackles and brands, deserving, for all his groans, no better than he demands. The flat routine of bed and barter, birth and burial, holds the lot. Was it I that dreamed of being a martyr? How? And for what? Yet, while this unconcern runs stronger as life shrugs on without meaning or shape, let me know flame and the teeth of hunger. Storm! Not escape. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died by Emily Dickinson. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness round my form was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes beside had wrung them dry, and breaths were gathering sure for that last onset when the king be witnessed in his power. I willed my keepsakes, signed away what portion of me I could make assignable, and then there interposed a fly with blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz between the light and me. And then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I love my love in the morning. By Gerald Griffin, read for LibriVox.org by Rufilwe Baloy. I love my love in the morning, for she like morn is fair. Her blushing cheek is crimson streak, its clouds her golden hair. Her glance, its beam so soft and kind. Her tears, its dewy showers, and her voice, the tender whispering wind that stays the early bowers. I love my love in the morning. I love my love at noon, for she is bright as the lords of light, yet as autumn's moon. Her beauty is my bosom's sun, her faith my fostering shade, and I will love my darling one till even the sun shall shake. I love my love in the morning. I love my love at even, her smiles soft place like the ray that lights in the western heaven i loved her when the sun was high i loved her when he rose but best of all when the evening's sigh was memory at 
its close. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In August by Babette Dorsch. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Smile. He urges secret odors from the grass, blunting the edge of silence, crickets shrill, wings veer, inane needles of light and pass, laced pools, the warm wood shadows ebb and fill, the wind is casual, loitering to crush, the sun upon his palate and to draw pungents from pine, frank fragrances from brush, sucked up through thin gray bows as through a straw. Moss green, fern green, and leaf and meadow green are broken by the bare bone-colored roads, less moved by stirring air than by unseen soft-footed ants and meditative toads. Summer is passing, taking what she brings, green scents and sound, and quick ephemeral wings. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Home Stretch by Robert Frost. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. She stood against the kitchen sink and looked over the sink out through a dusty window at weeds the water from the sink made tall. She wore her cape. Her hat was in her hand. Behind her was confusion in the room, of chairs turned upside down to sit like people in other chairs, and something come to look for every room a house has, parlor, bedroom, and dining room, thrown pell-mell in the kitchen. And now and then a smudged infernal face looked in a door behind her and addressed her back. She always answered without turning. Where will I put this walnut bureau, lady? Put it on top of something that's on top of something else, she laughed. Oh, put it where you can tonight and go. It's almost dark. You must be getting started back to town. Another blackened face thrust in and looked and smiled, and when she did not turn, spoke gently. What are you seeing out the window, lady? Never was I belated so before. Would evidence of having been called lady more than so many times make me a lady in common law, I wonder? But I ask, what are you seeing out the window, lady? What I'll be seeing more of in the years to come is here I stand and go the round of many plates with towels many times. And what is that? You only put me off. Rank weeds that love the water from the dishpan more than some women like the dishpan, Joe. A little stretch of mowing field for you. Not much of that till I come to woods that end all. And it's scarce enough to call a view. And yet you think you like it, dear? That's what you're so concerned to know. You hope I like it. Bang goes something big away off there upstairs. The very tread of men as great as those is shattering to the frame of such a little house. Once left alone, you and I, dear, will go with softer steps up and down stairs through the rooms, and none but sudden winds that snatch them from our hands will ever slam the doors. I think you see more than you like to own out that window. No, for besides the things I tell you of, I only see the years. They come and go in alternation with the weeds, the field, the wood. What kind of years? Why, latter years, different from early years. I see them, too. You didn't count them? No, the further off so ran together that I didn't try to. It can scarce be that they would be a number we'd care to know, for we are not young now. And bang goes something else away off there. It sounds as if it were the men went down, and every crash meant one less to return to lighted city streets we too have known, but now are giving up for country darkness. Come from the window where you see too much for me, and take a livelier view of things from here. They're going. 
Watch this husky swarming over the wheel into the sky-high seat, lighting his pipe now, squinting down his nose at the flame burning downward as he sucks it. See how it makes his nose side bright, a proof how dark it's getting. Can you tell what time it is by that, or by the moon, the new moon? What shoulder did I see her over? Neither. A wire she is of silver, as new as we to everything. Her light won't last us long. It's something, though, to know we're going to have her night after night, and stronger every night to see us through our first two weeks. But, Joe, the stove, before they go, knock on the window, ask them to help you get it on its feet. We stand here dreaming. Hurry, call them back. They're not gone yet. We've got to have the stove, whatever else we want for, and a light. Have we a piece of candle, if the lamp and oil are buried out of reach? Again the house was full of tramping, and the dark, door-filling men burst in and seized the stove. A cannon-mouth-like hole was in the wall, to which they set it true by eye, and then came up the jointed stovepipe in their hands, so much too light and airy for their strength that it almost seemed to come ballooning up slipping from clumsy clutches toward the ceiling. "'A fit,' said one, and banged a stovepipe shoulder. "'It's good luck when you move in to begin with good luck with your stovepipe. "'Never mind. It's not so bad in the country. "'Settle down when people are getting on in life. You'll like it.' "'Joe said, "'You big boys ought to find a farm and make good farmers "'and leave other fellows the city work to do. "'There's not enough for everybody as it is in there.' God, one said wildly, and when no one spoke, say that to Jimmy here, he needs a farm. But Jimmy only made his jaw recede fool-like and rolled his eyes as if to say he saw himself a farmer. Then there was a French boy who said with seriousness that made them laugh, My friend, you ain't know what it is you're ask. He doffed his cap and held it with both hands across his chest to make his tour a bow. We're giving you our chances on the farm. And then they all turned to with deafening boots and put each other bodily out of the house. Goodbye to them. We puzzle them. They think, I don't know what they think we see and what they leave us to. That pasture slope that seems the back some farm presents us and your woods to northward from your window at the sink waiting to steal a step on us whenever we drop our eyes or turn to other things, as in the game ten-step the children play. Good boys, they seemed, and let them love the city. All they could say was God when you proposed their coming out and making useful farmers. Did they make something lonesome go through you? It would take more than them to sicken you, us, of our bargain, but they left us so as to our fate, like fools past reasoning with, they almost shook me. It's all so much what we have always wanted. I confess it seeming bad for a moment makes it seem even worse still, and so on, down, down, down. It's nothing. It's their leaving us at dusk. I never bore it well when people went. The first night after guests have gone, the house seems haunted or exposed. I always take a personal interest in the locking up at bedtime, but the strangeness soon wears off. He fetched a dingy lantern from behind the door. There's that we didn't lose, and these, some matches he unpocketed. For food, the meals we've had no one can take from us. I wish that everything on earth were just as certain as the meals we've had. I wish the meals we haven't had were, anyway. What have you you know where to lay your hands on? The bread we bought in passing at the store. There's butter somewhere, too. Let's rend the bread. I'll light the fire for company for you. You'll not have any other company till Ed begins to get out on a Sunday to look us over and give us his idea of what wants pruning, shingling, breaking up. He'll know what he would do if he were we and all at once. He'll plan for us and plan to help us, but he'll take it out in planning. Well, you can set the table with a loaf. Let's see you find your loaf. I'll light the fire. I like chairs occupying other chairs, not offering a lady. There again, Joe. You're tired. I'm drunk, nonsensical tired out. 
I don't mind a word I say. It's a day's work to empty one house of all household goods and fill another with them fifteen miles away, although you do no more than dump them down. Dump down in paradise we are, and happy. It's all so much what I've always wanted. I can't believe it's what you wanted, too. Shouldn't you like to know? I'd like to know if it is what you wanted and how much you wanted it from me. A troubled conscience. You don't want me to tell if I don't know. I don't want to find out what can't be known. But who first said the word to come? My dear, it's who first thought the thought. You're searching, Joe, for things that don't exist. I mean beginnings, ends and beginnings. There are no such things. There are only middles. What is this? This life? Our sitting here by lantern light together amid the wreckage of a former home? You won't deny the lantern isn't new. The stove is not. And you are not to me, nor I to you. Perhaps you never were. It would take me forever to recite all that's not new and where we find ourselves. New is a word for fools in towns who think style upon style in dress and thought at last must get somewhere. I've heard you say as much. No, this is no beginning. Then an end. End is a gloomy word. Is it too late to drag you out for just a good night call on the old peach trees on the knoll, to grope by starlight in the grass for a last peach the neighbors may not have taken as their right when the house wasn't lived in? I've been looking. I doubt if they have left us many grapes. Before we set ourselves to right the house, the first thing in the morning out we go to go the round of apple, cherry, peach, pine, alder, Pasture, mowing, well, and brook. All of a farm it is. I know this much. I'm going to put you in your bed if first I have to make you build it. Come, the light. When there was no more lantern in the kitchen, the fire got out through crannies in the stove and danced in yellow wrigglers on the ceiling, as much at home as if they'd always danced there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Kindness to Animals by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schrempf Little children, never give pain to things that feel and live. Let the gentle robin come for the crumbs you save at home. As his meat you throw along, he'll repay you with a song. Never hurt the timid hare, peeping from her green grass lair. Let her come and sport and play, on the lawn at close of day. The little lark goes soaring high, to the bright windows of the sky, singing as if twere always spring, and fluttering on an untired wing. Oh, let him sing his happy song, nor do these gentle creatures wrong. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is my letter to the world by Emily Dickinson. Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza. This is my letter to the world. That never wrote to me. The simple news that nature told with tender majesty. Her message is committed to hands I cannot see. For love of her, sweet countrymen, judge tenderly of me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life, Part 1, Success, by Emily Dickinson. Read for LibriVox.org, by Garfield D'Souza. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. 
Not one of all the purple hosts who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory as he defeated, dying, on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph break, agonized and clear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life, Part 6 by Emily Dickinson Read for LibriVox.org by Garfield D'Souza If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Lights Out by Edward Thomas Read for LibriVox.org by N. R. Collard I have come to the borders of sleep, the unfathomable deep forest, where all must lose their way, however straight or winding, soon or late. They cannot choose. Many a road and track that since the dawn's first crack up to the forest brink deceived the travellers, suddenly now blurs, and in they sink. Here love ends, despair, ambition ends, all pleasure and all trouble, although most sweet or bitter, here ends in sleep that is sweeter than tasks most noble. There is not any book or face of dearest look that I would not turn from now. To go into the unknown, I must enter and leave alone. I know not how. The tall forest towers, its cloudy foliage lowers ahead, shelf above shelf. Its silence I hear and obey, that I may lose my way and myself. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines, written on the anniversary of Byrne's birthday, when wandering belated in the mountain gorges of Vermont, by Hugh Ainsley, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Last time my feeble voice I raised to thy immortal dwelling, the flame of friendship round me blazed, on breath of rapture swelling. Now far into a foreign land, the heavens above me scowling, the big bough waving like the wand, the forest caverns howling. No kindred voice is in mine ear, no heart with mine is beating, no tender eye of blue is near, my glance of kindness meeting. But rocky mountains, towering rude, dim heaven with their statures, Grim winter in his wildest mood, midst nature's roughest features. Yet thou who sung of nature's charms, in barrenness and blossom, thy strain of love and freedom warms the chill that's in my bosom. And here, where despotism is mute, and right hath the ascendance, oh, where's the land could better suit? the hymn to independence. Thou giant amongst the mighty dead, what bulls to thee are flowing, what souls of Scotia's noble breed with pride this night are glowing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain and Joan of Arc by Bachel Lindsay, read for LibriVox.org, by Joanna Michael Hoyt. When Yankee soldiers reach the barricade, then Joan of Arc gives each the accolade, for she is there in armor-clad today, all the young poets of the wide world say. Which of our freemen did she greet the first, seeing him come against the fires accursed? Mark Twain, our chief, with neither smile nor jest, leading to war our youngest and our best. The Yankee to King Arthur's court returns, 
the sacred flag of Joan above him burns, for she has called his soul from out the tomb, and where she stands there he will stand till doom. But I, I can but mourn, and mourn again at bloodshed caused by angels, saints, and men. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. May by Edward Hovell Thurlow Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher May, queen of blossoms and fulfilling flowers, With what pretty music shall we charm the hours? Wilt thou have pipe and reed blown in the open mead? Or to the lute give heed in the green bowers? Thou hast no need of us, or pipe, or wire, Thou hast the golden bee ripened with fire, And many more thousand songsters that thee adore, Filling earth's grassy floor with new desire. Thou hast thy mighty herds, tame and free livers, Doubt not the music too in the deep rivers, And the whole plummy flight, warbling the day and night, Up the gates of light. See, the lark quivers, End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Meditations by Margaret Fuller Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schampf Sunday, 12 May, 1833 The clouds are marshalling across the sky leaving their deepest tints upon yon range of soul-alluring hills. The breeze comes softly, laden with tribute that a hundred orchards now in their fullest blossom send, in thanks for this refreshing shower. The birds pour forth in heightened melody the notes of praise they had suspended while God's voice was speaking, and his eye flashing down upon his world. I sigh half charmed, half pained, my sense is living, and taking in this freshened beauty, tells its pleasure to the mind. The mind replies, and strives to wake the heart in turn, repeating poetic sentiments from many a record which other souls have left, when stirred and satisfied by scenes as fair, as fragrant but the heart sends back a hollow echo to the call of outward things, and its once bright companion, who erst would have been answered by a stream of life-fraught treasures, thankful to be summoned, can now rouse nothing better than this echo, unmeaning voice which mocks their softened accents, content thee, beautiful world, and hush, still busy mind, my heart hath sealed its fountains, to the things of time they shall be oped no more. Too long, too often were they poured forth. Part have sunk into the desert, part profaned and swollen by bitter waters, mixed by those who feigned they asked them for refreshment, which, turned back, have broken and o'erflowed their former urns. So when ye talk of pleasure, lonely world, and busy mind, ye never again shall move me to answer ye, though still your calls have power to jar me through and cause dull aching here. No so the voice which hailed me from the depths of yon dark-bosomed cloud, now vanishing before the sun greet ye. It touched my center, the voice of the Eternal, calling me to feel his other worlds, to feel that if I could deserve a home, I still might find it in other spheres, and bade me not despair, though want of harmony and aching void are terms invented by the men of this, which I may not forget. In former times I loved to see the lightnings flash athwart the stooping heavens. I loved to hear the thunder call to the seas and mountains, for I thought, tis thus man's flashing fancy doth enkindle the firmament of mind. Tis thus his eloquence calls unto the soul's depths and heights. And still I defied the creature, nor remembered the creator in his works. Ah, now how different! 
the proud delight of that keen sympathy is gone no longer riding on the wave but whelmed beneath it my own plans and works or as the scriptures phrase it my inventions no longer interpose twixt me and heaven Today, for the first time i felt the deity and uttered prayer on hearing thunder this must be thy will for finer higher spirits have gone through this same process yet i think there was religion in that strong delight those sounds those thoughts of power imparted true i did not say he is the lord thy god but i had feeling of his essence but twas pride by which the angels fell so be it but oh might i but see a little onward father i cannot be a spirit of power may i be active as a spirit of love since thou hast taken me from that path which nature seemed to appoint oh deign to ope another where i may walk with thought and hope assured lord i believe help thou mine unbelief had i but faith like that which fired novalis i too could bear that the heart fall in ashes while the freed spirit rises from beneath them with heavenward look and phoenix plumes up soaring and a poem this recording is in the public domain A Midnight Meeting by Hugh Ainsley Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Last night as my dreaming soul In the wildness of fancy roamed, Commingling the present and past, The living and long entombed, I came on a beautiful dell, The green beach at midsummer cools, and the brook leaves the flower bordered well to dimple the valley with pools. In the west lay a dark purple glow, the last bird of eve was awake, and I gazed as the night settled slow in the heart of a neighboring brake. When, as angels are said to have come, on the night path of wandering seer, a form seemed to grow from the gloom, and I shook as the vision drew near, for in form and in face it was thee, it was thee, oh, and lovely as when ye wept a sad farewell with me, and we vowed ne'er to weep it again. But a smile banished all but my love, all barriers that war with the will strong bonds that we may not remove have severed must sever us still then raptures mere flesh cannot give were mingled with bursts of delight tis an angel's life that we live when we live in the spirit at night End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Garden by Ralph Waldo Emerson Read for LibriVox.org by Jennifer If I could put my woods in song And tell what's there enjoyed All men would to my gardens throng And leave the city's void In my plot no tulips blow snow-loving pines and oaks instead and rank the savage maples grow from spring's faint flush to autumn red my garden is a forest ledge which older forests bound the banks slope down to the blue lake edge then plunge to depths profound here once the deluge ploughed laid the terraces one by one ebbing later whence it flowed they bleach and dry in the sun. The sowers made haste to depart, the wind and the birds which sowed it, not for fame nor by rules of art, planted these and tempests flowed it. Waters that wash my garden side play not in nature's lawful web. They heed not moon or solar tide, five years elapse from flood to ebb. 
hither hasted in old time jove and every god none did refuse and be sure at last come love and after love the muse keen ears can catch a syllable as if one spake to another in the hemlocks tall untamable and what the whispering grasses smother alien harps in the pine ring with the song of the fates infant bacchus in the vine far distant yet his choir awaits canst thou copy in verse one chime the wood bells peal and cry write in a book the morning's prime or match with words that tender sky wonderful verse of the gods of one import of varied tone they chant the bliss of their abodes to man imprisoned in his own ever the words of the gods resound but the porches of man's ear seldom in this low life's round are unsealed that he may hear wandering voices in the air and murmurs in the wold speak what i cannot declare yet cannot all withhold when the shadow fell on the lake the whirlwind in ripples wrote air bells of fortune that shine and break and omens have thought but the meanings cleave to the lake cannot be carried in book or urn go thy ways now come later back on waves and hedges still they burn these the fates of men forecast of better men than live to-day if who can read them comes at last he will spell in the sculpture stay end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Negro by Langston Hughes Read for LibriVox.org by Jacqueline Burrell Walton I am a Negro, black as the night is black, black like the depths of my Africa. I've been a slave. Caesar told me to keep his doorsteps clean. I brushed the boots of Washington. I've been a worker. Under my hand, the pyramids arose. I made mortar for the Woolworth building. I've been a singer. All the way from Africa to Georgia, I carried my sorrow songs. I made ragtime. I've been a victim. The Belgians cut off my hands in the Congo. They lynch me now in Texas. I am a Negro. Black as the night is black, black like the depths of my Africa. End of The Negro. This recording is in the public domain. An Ode by Thomas Green Pheasanton. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Almighty Power. The one supreme, our souls inspire, attune our lays with hearts as solemn as our theme, to sing Hosanna to thy praise. Then while we swell the sacred song, and bid the pealing anthem rise, may seraphim the strain prolong, and hymns of glory fill the skies. Thy word omnific formed this earth, ere time began revolving years, thy fiat gave to nature birth and tuned to harmony the spheres. When stern oppression's iron hand our pious fathers forced to roam, and o'er the wild wave seek the land where freedom rears her hallowed dome, when Tippus howled and o'er the main pale horror reared his haggard form, thou didst the fragile bark sustain to stem the fury of the storm. Thou badest the wilderness disclose the varied sweets of vernal bloom, the desert blossomed like the rose, and breathed Arabia's rich perfume. Look down from heaven's imperial height, and gild with smiles this happy day. Send us some chosen sun of light, our feet to guide in wisdom's way. The sons of faction strike with awe, and hush the din of party rage, that liberty, secured by law, may realize a golden age. On those thy choicest blessings shower to whom the cares of state are given, may justice wield the sword of power till earth's the miniature of heaven. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Pig's Tale by Lewis Carroll Read for LibriVox.org by N. R. Collard Little birds are dining warily and well, Hid in mossy cell, Hid, I say, by waiters, Gorgeous in their gaiters, I've a tale to tell. Little birds are feeding justices with jam, Rich in frizzled ham, Rich, I say, in oysters, Haunting shady cloisters, That is what I am. Little birds are teaching tigresses to smile, Innocent of guile, Smile, I say, not smirk or mouth a semicircle. That's the proper style. Little birds are sleeping all among the pins, Where the loser wins, Where, I say, he sneezes, When and how he pleases. So the tale begins. There was a pig that sat alone beside a ruined pump. By day and night he made his moan. It would have stirred a heart of stone To see him wring his hooves and groan, because he could not jump. A certain camel heard him shout, a camel with a hump. Oh, is it grief or is it gout? What is this bellowing about? That pig replied with quivering snout. Because I cannot jump. That camel scanned him dreamy-eyed. Methinks you are too plump. I never knew a pig so wide that wobbled so from side to side. Who could, however much he tried, do such a thing as jump? Yet mark those trees two miles away, all clustered in a clump. If you could trot there twice a day, nor ever pause for rest or play, in the far future who can say, you may be fit to jump? That camel passed and left him there, beside the ruined pump. Oh, horrid was that pig's despair, his shrieks of anguish filled the air, he wrung his hooves, he rent his hair, because he could not jump. There was a frog that wandered by, a sleek and shining lump, inspected him with fishy eye, and said, Oh, pig, what makes you cry? And bitter was that pig's reply, Because I cannot jump. That frog, he grinned a grin of glee, and hit his chest a thump. Oh, pig, he said, be ruled by me, and you shall see what you shall see. This minute for a trifling fee I'll teach you how to jump. You may be faint from many a fall and bruised by many a bump, but if you persevere through all and practice first on something small, concluding with a ten-foot wall, you'll find that you can jump. That pig looked up with joyful start. Oh, frog, you are a trump. Your words have healed my inward smart. Come name your fee and do your part. Bring comfort to a broken heart by teaching me to jump. My fee shall be a mutton chop, my goal this wind pump. Observe with what an airy flop I plant myself upon the top. Now bend your knees and take a hop, for that's the way to jump. Up rose that pig and rushed full whack against the ruined pump, rolled over like an empty sack, and settled down upon his back, while all his bones at once went crack. It was a fatal jump. Little birds are writing interesting books, to be read by cooks, read I say not roasted, letterpress when toasted loses its good looks. Little birds are playing bagpipes on the shore, where the tourists snore. Thanks, they cry. Tis thrilling. Take, oh, take this shilling. Let us have no more. Little birds are bathing crocodiles in cream, like a happy dream. Like but not so lasting crocodiles when fasting are not all they seem. That camel passed as day grew dim around the ruined pump. Oh, broken heart, oh, broken limb, it needs... That camel said to him, Something more fairy-like and slim To execute a jump. That pig lay still as any stone, And could not stir a stump, Nor ever, if the truth were known, 
was he again observed to moan nor ever wring his hooves and groan because he could not jump. That frog made no remark, for he was dismal as a dump. He knew the consequence must be that he would never get his fee, and still he sits in misery upon that ruined pump. Little birds are choking baronets with bun, taught to fire a gun, taught, I say, to splinter salmon in the winter, merely for the fun. Little birds are hiding crimes in carpet bags, blessed as happy stags, blessed, I say, though beaten, since our friends are eaten when the memory flags. Little birds are tasting gratitude in gold, pale with sudden cold, pale, I say, and wrinkled, when the bells have tinkled, and the tale is told. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ready by Phoebe Carey. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. Side note, 1861. Loaded with gallant soldiers, a boat shot into the land and lay at the right of Rodman's Point with her keel upon the sand. Lightly, gaily, they came to shore, and never a man afraid, when sudden the enemy opened fire from his deadly ambuscade. Each man fell flat on the bottom of the boat, and the captain said, If we lie here we all are captured, and the first who moves is dead. Then out spoke a negro sailor, no slavish soul had he. Somebody's got to die, boys, and it might as well be me. Firmly he rose and fearlessly stepped out into the tide. He pushed the vessel safely off, then fell across her side. Fell, pierced by a dozen bullets as the boat swung clear and free. But there wasn't a man of them that day who was fitter to die than he. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rest by Margaret Louisa Woods Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk To spend the long warm days Silent beside the silent stealing streams To see, not gaze To hear, not listen Thoughts exchanged for dreams See clouds that slowly pass trailing their shadows o'er the far faint down and ripening grass while yet the meadows wear their starry crown to hear the breezes sigh cool in the silver leaves like falling rain pause and go by tired wanderers o'er the solitary plain see far from all affright shy river creatures play hour after hour and night by night low in the west the white moon's folding flower thus lost to human things to blend at last with nature and to hear what song she sings low to herself when there is no one near End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Seven Words Spoken by the Lord Jesus on the Cross by Paul Gerhardt, 1607 to 1676. Read for LibriVox.org. 
the seven words spoken by the lord jesus on the cross my heart the seven words hear now that jesus christ has spoken when on the cross his heart through woe and murder dire was broken ope now the shrine and lock them in as gifts all price excelling in bitter grief they'll give relief neath crosses joy instilling his first and chiefest care he made who hated him to cover god for the wicked men he prayed that he'd their sin look over forgive forgive he said in love them every one o father not one doth see what doeth he in ignorance tis rather how fair it is let all learn here to love their foes who grieve them and all their faults with heart sincere i freely to forgive them he also shows how grace o'erflows his heart how kind his mood is that e'en his foe who'd work him woe doth in him find what good is then to his mother doth he speak who stood near him he loveth and as he can though voice be weak with words of comfort soothest woman there see thy son for me thou shalt by him be guarded disciple see let her by thee as mother be regarded o faithful heart thou carest for all thine own who truly love thee when they in tribulation fall thou seest the sight doth move thee a friend in need in word and deed thou at their side appearest doth by thy grace find them a place them to good souls endearest the third thing that thy lips have said thou spakest to him beside thee when think upon me then he prayed when god himself shall guide thee up to thy throne thy head shall crown as lord of earth and heaven to walk with me to-day shall thee in paradise be given o blessed word o voice of joy cannot affright us never let death who seeketh to destroy now disappear for ever though he rage sore what can he more than soul and body sever and meanwhile i mount up on high in joy to dwell for ever christ's word gives deepest peace and joy the robber's trouble stilleth but he cries from the agony his holy breast that filleth eli my god what heavy load am i thy son now bearing i call and thou art silent now though i sink seemest not caring this lesson learn thou child of faith when god his countenance veileth lest thou be cast down in the path when trouble thee assaileth firm to him cleave though he may leave he'll comfort soon and cheer thee true do thou be cry mightily until he turn and hear thee the lord his voice now clearly doth raise through thirst that paineth sorely i thirst the spring eternal says the lord of life and glory what meaneth he he showeth thee how he thy load sinks under that thou didst pile for him the while in sin's ways thou didst wander thereby he also telleth thee how much he longs that ever his cross in each may fruitful be fail of its end may never mark this all ye now carefully who are in soul tribulation the eternal son refuseth not the soul's part and salvation and as the gloomy night of death upon the lord descended tis finished he with dying breath said now my work is ended what was foretold in days of old by seers who went before me doth now be tied i'm crucified and men now triumph o'er me tis finished why then toilest thou in vain thy labor ever as if aught human strength can do could ever from guilt deliver tis done beware and never dare to add aught to it ever 
do thou believe in faith i cleave to him forsake him never his voice at length the lord doth raise high over all tis swelling my spirit father to the place take where thou art ever dwelling my soul receive that now doth leave this body sorely riven and at the word to the great lord release from pain was given o oh, would to god that i might end my life as his was ended my spirit unto god commend as his was then commended o oh, christ my lord may thy last word the last be by me spoken so happily i'll go to thee when life's last thread is broken end of poem this recording is in the public domain the slide of paul revere by grantland rice read for librivox dot org by larry wilson listen fanatics and you shall hear of the midnight slide of paul revere how he scored from first on an outfield drive by a dashing sprint and a headlong dive twas the greatest play pulled off that year now the home of poets and potted beans of emersonian ways and means in baseball epic has oft been sung since the days of Krieger and old Cy Young, but not even fleet, deer-footed Bay could have pulled off any such fancy play as the slide of P. Revere, which won the famous Battle of Lexington. The Yanks and the British were booked that trip in a scrap for the New World Championship, but the British landed a bit too late, so the game didn't open till half past eight and paul revere was dreaming away when the umpire issued his call for play on on they fought neath the boston moon as the british figured not yet but soon for the odds were against the yanks that night with paul revere blocked away from the fight and the grandstand gathering groaned in woe while a sad well bubbled from rooter's row but wait hist hearken and likewise hark what means that galloping near the park what means that cry of a man dead sore am i too late say what's the score and echo answered both far and near as the rooter shouted there's paul revere oh how sweetly that moon did shine when p revere took the coaching line he woke up the grandstand from its trance and made the bleachers get up and dance he joshed the british with a robust shout until they booted the ball about he whooped and clamored all over the lot till the score was tied in the gordian knot now when this part of the dope recooked are the facts which history overlooked how paul revere came to bat that night and suddenly ended the long-drawn fight how he singled to center and then straightway dashed on to second like harry bay kept traveling on with the speed of a bird till he whizzed like a meteor rounding third hold back your lobster but all in vain the coacher shouted in tones of pain for paul kept on with a swinging stride and he hit the ground when they hollered slide spectacular plays may come and go in the hurry of time's swift ebb and flow but never again will there be one like the first american hit and run and as long as the old game lasts you'll hear of the midnight slide of p revere in the poem this recording is in the public domain. Song for the Centenary of Walter Savage Landor by Algernon Charles Swinburne Read for LibriVox.org by Arden May 12th Song for the Centenary of Walter Savage Landor Born January 30th, 1775 Died September 17th, 1864 There is delight in singing though none here, beside the singer, and there is delight, in praising, though the praiser sit alone, and see the praised far off him, far above. Landor. Dedication. To Mrs. Lynn Linton. Daughter and spirit elect and consecrate, by love and reverence of the Olympian sire, whom I too loved and worship, seeing so great, and found so gracious to word my long desire, to bid that love and song before his gate. Sound and my lute be loyal to his lyre. To none, save one, it now may dedicate, 
Song's new burnt offering on a century's pyre. And though the gift be light, as ashes in men's sight, left by the flame of no ethereal fire, yet for his worthier sake, than words are worthless take, this wreath of words ere yet their hour expire. So haply, from some heaven above, he, seeing, may set next yours my sacrifice of love. May 24th, 1880. 1. Five years beyond a hundred years have seen, their winters, white as fates and ages hue, melt, smiling through brief tears that broke between, and hope's young conquering colors reared anew, since, on the day whose edge for kings made keen, smote sharper once than ever storm wind blew, a head predestined for the girdling green, that laughs at lightning all the seasons through, nor frost or change can sunder, its crown untouched of thunder, leaf from least leaf of all its leaves that grew, alone for brows too bold, for storm to sear of old, elect to shine in time's eternal view, rose on the verge of radiant life, between the winds and sunbeams, mingling love with strife. 2. The darkling day that gave its blood-red birth, to Milton's white republic undefiled, that might endure so few fleet years on earth, bore in him likewise as divine a child, but born not less for crowns of love and mirth, of palm and myrtle passionate and mild, the leaf that girds about with gentler girth, the brow steel bound in battle, and the wild, soft spray that flowers above, the flower soft hair of love, and the white lips of wayworn winter smiled, and grew serene as springs, when with stretched clouds like wings, or wings like drift of snow clouds massed and piled, the godlike giant, softening, spread, a shadow of stormy shelter round the newborn head. 3. And o'er it brightening bowed the wild-haired hour, and touched his tongue with honey and with fire, and breathed between his lips the note of power, that makes of all the winds of heaven a lyre, whose strings are stretched from topmost peaks that tower, to softest springs of waters that suspire, with sounds too dim to shake the lowliest flower, breathless with hope and dauntless with desire, and bright before his face, that hour became a grace, as in the light of their Athenian choir, when the hours before the sun and graces were made one, called by sweet love down from the aerial gyre, by one dear name of natural joy, to bear on her bright breast from heaven a heaven-born boy. 4. Ere light could kiss the little lids in sunder, or love could lift them for the sun to smite, his fiery birth star as a sign of wonder, had risen perplexing the presageful night, with shadow and glory around her sphere and under, and portents prophesying by sound and sight, and half the sound was song, and half was thunder, and half his life of lightning, half of light, and in the soft clenched hand, shone like a burning brand, a shadowy sword for swordless fields of fight, wrought only for such lord, as so may wield the sword, that all things ill be put to fear and flight, e'en at the flash and sweep and gleam, of one swift stroke beheld, but in a shuddering dream. 5. Like the sun's rays that blind the night's wild beasts, the sword of song shines as the swordsman sings. From the west wind's verge into the arduous east's, the splendor of the shadow that it flings, makes fire and storm in heaven above the feasts of men fulfilled with food of evil things, strikes dumb the lying and hungering lips of priests, smites dead the slaying and ravening hands of kings, turns dark the lamp's hot light, and turns the darkness bright, as with the shadow of dawn's reverberate wings, and far before its way, heaven, yearning toward the day, shines with its thunder and round its lightning rings, and never hand yet earlier played, with that keen sword whose hilt is cloud and fire its blade. 6. As dropping flakes of honey heavy dew, more soft than slumbers, fell the first note sound, from strings the swift young hand strayed lightlier through, than leaves through calm air wheeling toward the ground. Stray down the drifting wind when skies are blue, nor yet the wings of latter winds unbound, ere winter loosen all the Aeolian crew, with storm unleashed behind them like a hound, as lightly rose and sank beside a green-flowered bank, the clear first notes his burning boyhood found, to sing her sacred praise, who rode her city's ways, clothed with bright hair and with high purpose crowned, 
a song of soft presageful breath, prefiguring all his love and faith in life and death. 7. Who should love two things only, and only praise, more than all else forever, e'en the glory, of goodly beauty in women whence all days, take light whereby death's self seems transitory, and loftier love than loveliest eyes can raise, love that wipes off the miry stains and gory, from time's worn feet, besmirched on blood-red ways, enlightens with his light the night of story, love that lifts up from dust, life and makes darkness just, and purges as with fire of purgatory, the dense disastrous air, to burn old falsehood bare, and give thee wind its ashes heaped in hoary, love, that with eyes of ageless youth, sees on the breast of freedom, born her nursling truth. 8. For at his birth the sistering stars were one, that flamed upon it as one fiery star, freedom whose light makes pale the mounting sun, and song whose fires are quenched when freedoms are. Of all that love not liberty, let none love her that fills our lips with fire from far, to mix with winds and seas in unison, and sound athwart life's tideless harbor bar, out where our songs fly free, across time's bounded sea, a boundless flight beyond the dim sun car, till all the spheres of night chime conquered round their flight, too loud for blasts of warring change to mar, from stars that sang for Homer's birth. To these that gave our lander welcome back from earth. 9. Shine, as above his cradle, on his grave, Stars of our worship, lights of our desire, For never man that heard the world's wind rave, To you was truer in trust of heart and lyre, Nor Greece nor England on a brow more brave, Behold your flame against the wind burn higher, Nor all the gusts that blanch life's worldly wave, With surf and surge could quench its flawless fire, nor blast of all that blow, might bid the torch burn low, that lightens on us yet as o'er his pyre, indomitable of storm, that now no flaws deform, nor thwart winds baffle ere it all aspire, one light of godlike breath and flame, to write on heaven with man's most glorious names, his name. 10. The very dawn was dashed with stormy dew, and freight with fire as when God's hand would mar, palaces reared of tyrants and the blue, Deep heaven was kindled round her thunderous car, That saw how swift a gathering glory grew, About him risen, ere clouds could blind or bar, A splendor strong to burn and burst them through, And mix in one sheer light things near and far, First flew before his path, light shafts of love and wrath, But winged and edged as elder warriors are, Then rose a light that showed, across the mid-sea road, From radiant Calpe to revealed Massar, the way of war and love and fate, between the goals of fear and fortune, hope and hate. 11. Mine own twice banished father's harbor land, their nursing mother France, the well-beloved, by the arduous blast of sanguine sunrise fan, flamed on him, and his burning lips were moved, as that live statue's throned on Libyan sand, when morning moves it, ere her light faith roved, from promise, and her tyrant's poisonous hand, fed hope with Corsic honey till she proved more deadly than despair, and falser e'en than fair, though fairer than all elder hopes removed, as landmarks by the crime of inundating time, light faith by grief too loud, too long reproved. For e'en as in some darkling dance, wronged love changed hands with hate, and turned his heart from France. 12. But past the snows and summits Pyrenean, Love stronger winged held more prevailing flight, that o'er Tyrrhene, Iberian, and Aegean, shores lightened with one storm of sound and light, from earliest e'en to hoariest years one paean, rang rapture through the fluctuant roar of fight, from Nestor's tongue in accents Achaean, on death's blind verge, dominant overnight, for voice as hand in hand, as voice for one fair land, rose radiant, smote sonorous past the height, where darkling pines and robe, the steel cold lake of Gobe, deep as dark death and keen as death to smite, to where on peak or moor or plain, his heart and song and sword were one to strike for Spain. 13. Resurgent at his lifted voice and hand, pale in the light of war or treacherous fate, song bade before him all their shadows stand, for whom his will unbarred their funeral great, the father by whose wrong revenged his land, 
was given for sword and fire to desolate. Rose, fire encircled as a burning brand. Great as the woes he wrought and bore were great. Fair as she smiled and died. Death's crown and breathless bride. Smiled as one living e'en on craft and hate. And pity, a star unrisen. Scarce lit Ferrante's prison. Ere night unnatural closed the natural gate. That gave their life and love and light. To those fair eyes despoiled by fratricide of sight. 14. Tears bright and sweet as fire and incense fell. In perfect notes of music measured pain. On veiled sweet heads that heard not love's farewell. Sobbed through the song that bade them rise again. Rise in the light of living song. To dwell with memories crowned of memory. So the strain made soft as heaven the stream that girdles hell. And sweet the darkness of the breathless plain. And with Elysian flowers, recrowned the wreathless hours, That mused and mourned upon their works in vain, For all their works of death, song filled with light and breath, And listening grief relaxed her lightning chain. For sweet as all the wide sweet south, She found the song like honey from the lion's mouth. 15. High from his throne in heaven, Simonides, Crowned with mild aureole of memorial tears, that the everlasting sun of all time sees, all golden, molten from the forge of years, smiled as the gift was laid upon his knees, of song that hang like pearls in mourners' ears, mild as the murmuring of Hymedian bees, and honeyed as their harvest that endears, the toil of flowery days, and smiling perfect praise, hailed his one brother mateless else of peers, whom we that hear not him, for length of date grown dim, here, and the heart grows glad of grief that hears, and harshest heights of sorrowing hours, like snows of alpine April, melt from tears to flowers. 16. Therefore to him the shadow of death was none, the darkness was not, nor the temporal tomb, and multitudinous time for him was one, who bade before his equal seat of doom, rise and stand up for judgment in the sun, the weavers of the world's large history loom, by their own works of light or darkness done, clothed round with light or girt about with gloom. In speech of purer gold than e'en they spake of old, he bade the breath of Sydney's lips reloom, the fire of thought and love that made his bright life move through fair brief seasons of benignant bloom to blameless music ever strong as death and sweet as death annihilating song. 17. Thought gave his wings the width of time to roam. Love gave his thought strength equal to release. From bonds of old forgetful years like foam. Vanish the fame of memories that decrease. So strongly faith had fledged for flight from home. The soul's large pinions till her strife should cease. And through the trumpet of a child of Rome. Rang the pure music of the flutes of Greece. As though some northern hand. Reft from the Latin land a spoil more costly than the Colchian fleece, to clothe with golden sound of old joy newly found, and rapture as of penetrating peace. The naked north wind's cloudiest climb, and give its darkness light of the old Sicilian time. 18. He saw the brand that fired the towers of Troy fade in the darkness at Enoni's prayer, close upon her that closed upon her boy, for all the curse of Godhead that she bare. And the Apollonian serpent gleam and toy, With scathless maiden limbs and shuddering hair, And his love smitten in their dawn of joy, Leave Pan the pine leaf of her charge to wear, And one in flowery coils, Caught as in fiery toils, Smite Caledon with mourning unaware, And where her low turf shrine Showed modesty divine, The fairest mother's daughter far more fair, Hide on her breast the heavenly shame That kindled once with love, should kindle Troy with flame. 19. Nor less the light of story than of song, with graver glories girt his godlike head, reverted all way from the temporal throng of lives that live not toward the living dead. The shadows and the splendors of their throng made bright and dark about his board and bed, the lines of life and vision, sweet or strong, with sound of lutes or trumpets blown that led forth of the ghostly gate Opening in spite of fate, shapes of majestic or tumultuous tread, divine and direful things, 
these foul as priests or kings, and those fair as heaven are love of freedom, red, with blood and green with palms, and white, with raiment woven of deeds, divine, and words of light. 20. The thunder fire of Cromwell and the ray, that keeps the place of Phocian's name serene, and clears the cloud from Kosciuszko's day. Alternate as dark hours with bright between, met in the heaven of his high thought, which lay, for all stars open that all eyes had seen, rise on the night or twilight of the way, where feet of human hopes and fears had been. Again the sovereign word on Milton's lips was heard, living again the tender three days queen, drew bright and gentle breath on the sharp edge of death, and staged again to show of mortal scene. Tiberius, ere his name grew dire, wept, stainless yet of empire, tears of blood and fire. 21. Most ardent and most awful and most fond, the fervor of his Apollonian eye, yearned upon Hellas, yet enthralled in bond, of time whose years beheld her and passed by, silent and shameful, till she rose and dawned, the cask again the palace, for her cry, forth of the past and future, depths beyond, this where the present and its tyrants lie, as one great voice of twain, for him had pealed again, heard but of hearts high as her own was high, high as her own and his, and pure as love's heart is, that lives though hope at once and memory die, and with her breath his clarion's blast was filled as cloud with fire, or future souls with past. 22. As a wave only obsequious to the wind, leaps to the lifting breeze that bids it leap, large-hearted and its thickening mane be thinned, by the strong god's breath, moving on the deep. From utmost Atlas e'en the extremest end, that shakes the plain where no men sow nor reap. So, moved with wrath toward men that ruled and sinned, and pity toward all tears he saw men weep, arose to take man's part, his loving lion heart, kind as the sons that has in charge to keep, earth and the seed thereof, safe in his lordly love, strong as sheer truth and soft as very sleep, the mightiest heart since Milton's leapt, the gentlest since the gentlest heart of Shakespeare slept. 23. Like the wind's own unheard divided sea, his song arose on Corinth, and aloud, recalled her Ismian song and strife, when she was thronged with glories as with gods in crowd, and as the wind's own spirit her breath was free, and as the heaven's own heart her soul was proud, but freer and prouder stood no son than he, of all she bare before her heart was bowed, none higher than he who heard Medea's keen last word, transpierce her traitor, and like a rushing cloud, that sundering shows a star, saw past her thunderous car, and a face whiter and deadlier than a shroud, that lightened from it, and the brand of tender blood that falling seared his suppliant hand. 24. More fair than all things born and slain of fate, more glorious than all births of days and nights, he bade the spirit of man regenerate, rekindling rise, and reassume the rites, that in high seasons of his old estate clothed him in armed with majesties and mights, heroic when the times and hearts were great, and in the depths of ages rose the heights, radiant of high deeds done, and souls that matched the sun, for splendor with the lightnings of their lights, once e'en their uttered names burn like the strong twin flames, of song that shakes the throne and steel that smites, as on Thermopylae when shown, Leonidas, on Syracuse, Timoleon, 25. Or, sweeter than the breathless buds when spring, with smiles and tears and kisses bids them breathe, fell with its music from his choiring string, fragrance of pine leaves and odorous heath, twine round the lute whereto he sighed to sing, of the oak that screened and showed its maid beneath, who seeing her bee crawl back with broken wing, faded a fairer flower than all her wreath, and paler, though her oak, stood scatheless of the stroke, more sharp than edge of axe or wolfish teeth, that mixed with mortals dead, her own half-heavenly head, and life and corporate with a sylvan sheath, and left the wild rose and the dove, a secret place, and sacred from all guests but love. 26. But in the sweet clear fields beyond the river, 
dividing pain from peace and man from shade. He saw the wings that there no longer quiver. Think of the hours whose parting footfalls fade on ears which hear the rustling amaranth shiver with sweeter sound of wind than ever made. Music on earth, departing they deliver. The soul that shame or wrath or sorrow swayed and round the king of men clash thee clear arms again. Clear of all soil and bright as laurel braid that rang less high for joy through the gates fallen of Troy than here to hail the sacrificial maid. Iphigenia, when the ford, fast flowing of sorrows, brought her father and their lord. 27. And in the clear gulf of the hollow sea, he saw light glimmering through the grave green gloom that hardly gave the sun's eye leave to see. Simo Demea, but nor tower nor tomb, no tower on earth, no tomb of waves may be, that may not sometime buy diviner doom. Be plain and previous to the poet, he, bids time stand back from him, and fate make room for passage of his feet, strong as their own are fleet, and yield the prey no years may reassume, through all their clamorous track, nor night nor day win back, nor give to darkness what his eyes illume, and his lips bless forever. He knows what earth knows not, sings true, sung not of the sea. 28. Before the sentence of a curial chair, more sacred than the Roman, rose and stood, to take their several doom, the imperial pair, diversely born of Venus, and in mood, diverse as their one mother, and as fair, though like two stars contrasted, and as good, though different as dark eyes from golden hair, one as that iron planet, red like blood, that bears among the stars, fierce witness of her Mars, in bitter fire by her sweet light subdued, one in the gentler skies, sweet as her amorous eyes, one proud of worlds and seas and darkness rude, composed and conquered, one content, with lightnings from loved eyes of lovers lightly sent. 29. And where Alpheus and where Laden ran, radiant by many a rushy and rippling cove, more known to glance of God than wandering man, he sang the strife of strengths divine that strove, unequal, one with other for a span, who should be friends forever in heaven above. And here on pastoral earth, Arcadian Pan, and the aweless lord of kings and shepherds love, all the sweet strife and strange, with fervid counterchange, till one fierce wail through many a glade and grove, rang, and its breath made shiver, the reeds of many a river, and the warm airs waxed wintry that it clove, keen-edged as ice retempered brand, nor might God's hurt find healing, save of godlike hand. 30. As when the jarring gates of thunder ope, like earthquake felt in heaven so dire a cry, so fearful and so fierce, give thee sword scope, rang from a daughter's lips, darkening the sky, to the extreme azure of all its cloudless cope, with starless horror, nor the god's own eye, whose doom bade smite, whose ordinance bade hope, might well endure to see the adulteress die, the husband slayer fordone, by sword stroke of her son, unutterable, unimaginable on high, on earth abhorrent, fell, beyond all scourge of hell. Yet righteous as redemption, love stood nigh, mute, sister-like, and closer clung, than all fierce forms a threatening coil and maddening tongue. 31. All these things heard and seen and sung of old, he heard and saw and sang them once again. My foot of man tread, eye of man behold, things unbeholden save of ancient men. Ways saved by gods untrodden, in his hold, the staff that stayed through some Etnean glen, the steps of the most highest, most awful souled, and mightiest mouthed of singers, e'en as then, became a prophet's rod, a lyre on fire of God, being still the staff of exile, yea, as when, the voice poured forth on us, was e'en of Eshelus, and his one word great as the crying of ten, crying in men's ears of wrath toward wrong of love toward right immortal, sanctified with song. 32. Him too, whom none save one before him ever, beheld, nor since hath man again beholden, whom Dante seeing him saw not, nor the giver, of all gifts back to man by time withholden. Shakespeare, him too, whom sea-like ages sever, as waves divide men's eyes from lights upholden, to landward from our songs that find him never, seeking, though memory fire and hope embolden, him too this one song found, 
and raised at its sole sound, up from the dust of darkling dreams and olden, legends forlorn of breath, up from the deeps of death, Ulysses, him whose name turns all songs golden, the wise divine strong soul, whom fate could make no less than change, and chance beheld him great. 33. Nor stands the seer who raised him less august before us, nor in judgment frail and wraith, less constant or less loving or less just, but fruitful, ripe, and full of tender faith, holding all high and gentle names in trust, of time for honor, so his quickening breath, called from the darkness of their martyred dust, our sweet saints Alice and Elizabeth, revived and re-inspired, with speech from heavenward fired, by love to say what love the archangel saith, only, nor may such word, save by such ears be heard, as hear the tongues of angels after death, descending on them like a dove, has taken all earthly sense of thought away but love. 34. All sweet, all sacred, all heroic things, all generous names and loyal, and all wise, with all his heart and all its wayfarings, he sought and worshipped, seeing them with his eyes, in very present glory, clothed with wings, of words and deeds and dreams immortal, rise, visible more than living slaves and kings, audible more than actual vows and lies, these with scorn's fieriest rod, these and the Lord their God, the Lord their likeness, tyrant of the skies, is they Lord gods of earth, these with a rage of mirth, he mocked and scourged and spat on in such wise, that none might stand before his rod, and these being slain, the spirit alone be Lord or God. 35. For of all souls for all time glorious none, loved freedom better, of all who have loved her best, than he who wrote that scripture of the sun, writ as with fire and light on heaven's own crest, of all words heard on earth the noblest one, that ever spake for souls and left them blessed, gladly we should rest ever, had we won, freedom, we have lost, and very gladly rest. O oh, poet, hero, lord, and father, we record, deep in the burning tablets of the breast, thankfully those divine, and living words of thine, for faith and comfort in our hearts impressed, with strokes engraven past heard of years, and lines inured with fire of immemorial tears. 36. But who being less than thou shall sing of thee, words worthy of more than pity, or less than scorn, who sang the golden garland woven of three. My daughters, grace is mightier than the morn, more godlike than the graven gods men see, made all but immortal, human born, and heavenly natured, with the first came he, led by the living hand, who left forlorn, life by his death and time, more by his life sublime, than by the lives of all whom all men mourn, and e'en for mourning praise, heaven, as for all those days, these dead men's lives clothed round with glories worn, by memory till all time lie dead, and higher than all behold the bay round Shakespeare's head. 37. Then, fairer than the fairest grace of ours, came girt with Grecian gold the second grace, and verier daughter of his most perfect hours, than any of latter time or alien place, named, or with hair and woven of English flowers, only nor wearing on her statelier face the lordlier light of Athens, all the powers that graced and guarded round that holiest race, that heavenliest and most high, time hath seen live and die, poured all their power upon him to retrace the erased immortal roll of love's most sovereign scroll, and wisdom's warm from freedom's wide embrace, the scroll that on Aspasia's knees laid once made manifest the Olympian Pericles. 38. Clothed on with tenderest weft of Tuscan air, Came laughing like Etrurian Spring the Third, With green Valdelsa's hill flowers in her hair, Deep drenched with Medus, in her voice the bird, Whose voice hath night and morning in it, fair, As the ambient gold of wallflowers that engird, The walls engirdling with a circling stare, My sweet San Gimignano, nor a word, Fell from her flower-like mouth, Not sweet with all the South, as though the dust shrined in, Chertaldo stirred, and spake as o'er it shone, that bright pentameron, and his own vines again and chestnuts heard, Boccaccio, nor swift Elsa's chime, mixed not her golden babble with Petrarca's rhyme. 39. No lovelier laugh the garden which receives, yet, and yet hides not from our following eyes, 
with soft rose laurels and strawberry leaves, turn as a sweet as April colored skies, bowed like a flowering reed when May's wind heaves, the reed bed that the stream kisses and sighs, in love that shrinks and murmurs and believes, what yet the wisest of the starriest wise, whom Greece might ever hear, speaks in the gentlest ear, that ever heard love's lips philosophize, with such deep reasoning words as blossoms use in birds, nor heeds Leontion lingering till they rise, far off and no wise over far, beneath a heaven all amorous of its firstborn star. 40. What sound, what storm and splendor of what fire, darkening the light of heaven, lightening the night, rings, rages, flashes round what ravening pyre, that makes time's face pale with its reflex light, and leaves on earth whose seeing might scarce respire, a shadow of red remembrance, right nor might, alternating war ever shapes more dire, nor manifest in all men's awful sight, in form and face that war, heaven's light and likeness more, than these, or held suspense men's hearts at height, more fearful since man first, slaked with man's blood his thirst, than when Rome clashed with Hannibal in fight, till tower on ruining tower was hurled, where Scipio stood, and Carthage was not in the world. 41. Nor lacked their power of purpose in his hand, who carved their several praise in words of gold, to bear the brows of conquerors and to brand, made shelterless of laurels bought and sold, for price of blood or incense, dust or sand. Triumph or terror, he that sought of old, his father Ammon in a stranger's land, and shrank before the serpentining fold, stood in our seer's wide eye, no higher than man most high, and lowest in heart when highest in hope to hold, fast as a scripture furled, the scroll of all the world, sealed with his signet, nor the blind and bold, first thief of empire, round whose head, swarm carrion flies for bees, on flesh for violets fed. Footnote. Thy lifelong works, Napoleon, who shall write? Time in his children's blood, who takes delight? From the Greek of Landor. End footnote. 42. As fire that kisses, killing with a kiss, he saw the light of death, riotous and red, flame round the bent brows of Semiramis, re-risen and mightier from the Assyrian dead, kindling as dawn a frost-bound precipice, the steady snows of Russia for the tread, of feet that felt before them crawl and hiss, the snaky lines of blood violently shed, like living, creeping things, that writhe but have no stings, to scare adulterers from the imperial bed, bowed with its load of lust, or chill the ravenous gust that made her body a fire from heel to head, or change her high bright spirit and clear for all its mortal stains from taint of fraud or fear. 43. As light that blesses, hallowing with a look, he saw the godhead in Vittoria's face shine soft on Bonarotti's till he took, albeit himself God, a more godlike grace, a strength more heavenly to confront and brook, all ill things coiled about his worldly race, from the bright scripture of that present book, wherein his tired grand eyes got power to trace, comfort more sweet than youth, and hope whose child was truth, and love that brought forth sorrow for a space, only that she might bear, joy, these things written there, made e'en his soul's high heaven a heavenlier place, perused with eyes whose glory and glow had in their fires the spirit of Michelangelo, 44. With balms and dews of blessing he consoled, the fair fame wounded by the black priest's fang, Giovanna's, and washed off her blithe and bold, boy bridegroom's blood that seemed so long to hang on her fair hand, e'en till the stain of old was cleansed with healing song, that after saying, sharp truth by sweetest singer's lips untold of pale Beatrice, though her death note rang from other strings divine ere his rekindling line, with yet more piteous and intolerant pang, pierced all men's hearts anew, that heard her passion through, till fierce from throes of fiery pity sprang, wrath, armed for chase of monstrous beasts, strong to lay waste the kingdom of the seed of priests. 45. He knew the high-souled humbleness, the mirth, and majesty of meanest men born free, that made with Luther's or with Hoofer's birth, the whole world worthier of the sun to see, the wealth of spared among the snows, the dearth, wherein souls festered by the servile sea, 
that saw the lowest of e'en crowned heads on earth, thronged round with worship in Parthenope. His hand bade justice guide, her child tyrannicide, light winged by fire that brings the dawn to be, and pierced with Tyrrell's dart, again the riotous heart, that mocked at mercy's tongue and manhood's knee, and oped the cell where king-like death hung o'er her brows discrowned, who bare Elizabeth. 46. Toward Spencer or toward Bacon, proud or kind, he bared the heart of Essex, twain and one, for thee base heart that soiled the starry mind, stern, for the father in his child undone, soft as his own to her children, stamped and signed, with their sweet image visibly set on, as by God's hand, clear as his own designed, the likeness radiant out of ages gone, that none may now destroy, of that high Roman boy, whom Julius and Cleopatra saw their son, true born of sovereign seed, foredoomed e'en thence to bleed, the stately grace of bright Caesarian, the head unbent, the heart unbowed, that not the shadow of death could make less clear and proud. 47. With gracious gods he communed, honoring thus, at once by service and similitude, service devout and worship emulous, of the same golden muses once they wooed, the names and shades adored of all of us, the nurslings of the brave world's earlier brood, grown gods for us themselves, Theocritus, first and more dear Catullus, names bedewed, with blessings bright like tears, from the old memorial years, and loves and lovely laughters every mood, sweet as the drops that fell, of their own enamel, from living lips to cheer the multitude, that feeds on words divine and grows, more worthy, seeing their world re-blossom like a rose. 48. Peace, the soft seal of long life's closing story, the silent music that no strange note jars, Crown not with gentler hands the years that glory, crowned, but could hide not all the spiritual scars. Time writes on the inward strengths of warriors hoary, with much long warfare and with gradual bars, blindly pent in, but these, being transitory, broke and the power came back that passion mars. And at the lovely last, above all anguish past, before his own the sightless eyes like stars, arose that watched the rise, like stars in other skies. Above the strife of ships and hurtling cars, the Dioscarian songs divine, that lighten all the world with lightning of their line. 49. He sang the last of Homer, having sung, the last of his Ulysses, bright and wide. For him time's dark straight ways, like clouds that clung, about the day star, doubtful to divide, waxed in his spiritual eye shot, and his tongue, spake as his soul bore witness, that descried, like those twin towering lights in darkness hung, Homer, and grey Laertes at his side, kingly as kings are none, beneath a later sun, and these sweet mated ministering in pride, to sovereign and to sage, in their more sweet old age, these things he sang, himself is old, and died, and if death be not, if life be, as Homer and as Milton are in heaven is he. 50. Poet whose large-eyed loyalty of love, was pure toward all high poets, all their kind, and all bright words and all sweet works thereof, strong like the sun, and like the sunlight kind, heart that no fear but every grief might move, wherewith men's hearts were bound of powers that bind, the purest soul that ever proof could prove, from taint of tortuous or of envious mind, whose eyes elate and clear, nor shame nor ever fear, but only pity or glorious wrath could blind, Name set for love apart, held lifelong in my heart, face like a father's toward my face inclined, no gift like thine or mine to give, who by thine own words only bid thee hail and live. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 91 by William Shakespeare Read for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. Some glory in their birth, some in their skill, Some in their wealth, some in their body's force, Some in their garments, though new-fangled ill, Some in their hawks and hounds, some in their horse, And every humor hath its adjunct pleasure, Wherein it finds a joy above the rest. But these particulars are not my measure, 
all these i better in one general best thy love is better than high birth to me richer than wealth prouder than garments cost of more delight than hawks and horses be and having thee of all men's pride i boast wretched in this alone that thou mayest take all this away and me most wretched make End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spring by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read for LibriVox.org by Joanna Michael Hoyt. Nothing is so beautiful as spring, when weeds and wheels shoot long and lovely and lush, thrushes' eggs look little low heavens, and thrush through the echoing timber does so rinse and wring the ear. It strikes like lightnings to hear him sing. The glassy pear tree leaves and blooms, they brush the descending blue. That blue is all in a rush with richness. The racing lambs, too, have fair their fling. What is all this juice and all this joy? A strain of the earth's sweet being in the beginning, in Eden garden. Have, get before it cloy, before it cloud, Christ, Lord, and sour with sinning, innocent mind and mayday in girl and boy. Most, O oh maid's child, thy choice, and worthy the winning. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spring with the Teacher by Eva A. Jesse Read for LibriVox.org by Jacqueline Burrell Walton Spring with the teacher. Tis now the time of silver moon, of swelling bud and fancies free, as western winds, but then, ah me, May cannot come too soon. The rover calls in every child and sets his pulses running wild. Do stop that noise and take your seat. Joe learned to study quietly. Why, girl, it surely has me beat. How you forget geography? Brazil's in Spain? Here, close that book. What caused the Civil War, you say? Susanna says somebody took her beads. Return them right away. Now, boy, I told you once before to put that storybook away. I'll call the roll. Beatrice Moore, why were you absent yesterday? Why, yes, I heard that mockingbird. Lee Arthur, straighten up your face. Well, surely, class, you never heard of adverse having tense and case. Now, James, explain the term percent. My, my, tis surely not forgot. If it were fun or devilment, you'd know it all, sir, like as not. Who put that bent pen in my chair? No one, of course, bent pens can walk. I'll tell you, though, had I sat there, I'd make these straps and switches talk. A picnic on for Saturday? I wish that I was going, too. Oh, no, I couldn't get away. I have so many things to do. Well, there's the bell. Goodbye. Goodbye. And be good children, don't forget. Well, thank the Lord they're gone but I can hear their joyous laughter yet. Tis now the time of silver moon, of swelling bud and fancies free, as western winds, but then, ah me, May cannot come too soon. End of Spring with the Teacher. This recording is in the public domain. To S.N by Hugh Ainsley Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist When first we met, and that dark eye disturbed me, yet I know not why, I said, for heaven, there is a snare that thoughtless boyhood should beware, nor did my thinkings wander then to harder hearts or older men. But when that lovely eye of jet in swimming tenderness was set, when thy lip quivered in the breath, 
that heaved those heavenly hills beneath then rushed those feelings on the heart to which we cannot say depart yes nature unto some hath given gems from her jewelry of heaven and he can calmly look on such hath felt too little or too much farewell i would not have thee feel those pangs i may not bid thee heal nor offer thee fair as thou art love's lees the embers of a heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain the voortrekker by rudyard kipling read for LibriVox.org by ike Scher. the gull shall whistle in his wake the blind wave break in fire he shall fulfill god's utmost will unknowing his desire and he shall see old planets pass and alien stars arise and give the gale his sea-worn sail in shadow of new skies Strong lust of gear shall drive him forth, and hunger arm his hand, To win his food from their desert rude, his foothold from the sand. His neighbour's smoke shall vex his eyes, their voices break his rest, He shall go forth, till south is north, sullen and dispossessed. He shall desire loneliness, and his desire shall bring hard on his heels A thousand wheels, a people, and a king. He shall come back in his own track, and by his scarce cooled camp. There shall he meet the roaring street, the derrick, and the stamp. There he shall blaze a nation's ways with hatchet and with brand, till on his last one wilderness an empire's outposts stand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wanderlust by Gerald Gould Read for LibriVox.org by Ike Scher Beyond the east the sunrise, beyond the west the sea, And east and west the wanderlust that will not let me be. It works in me like madness, dear, to bid me say goodbye, For the sea calls and the stars call, And oh, the call of the sky! I know not where the white road runs, nor what the blue hills are, but man can have the sun for friend, and for his guide a star. And there's no end of voyaging when once the voice is heard, for the river calls and the road calls, and oh, the call of a bird. Yonder the long horizon lies, and there by night and day the old ships draw to home again. The young ships sail away, and come I may, but go I must, and if men ask you why, you may put the blame on the stars and the sun, and the white road, and the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. We Defer Things by James Whitcomb Riley Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee We say and we say and we say We promise, engage, and declare Till a year from tomorrow is yesterday And yesterday is where End of poem This recording is in the public domain. We Wear the Mask by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Read for LibriVox.org by Jacqueline Burrell Walton. We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile, with torn and bleeding hearts, we smile, 
and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, O oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. End of We Wear the Mask. This recording is in the public domain. Where is the Real Non-Resistant? by Rachel Lindsay. Read for LibriVox.org by Joanna Michael Hoyt. Matthew 5, 38-48 Who can surrender to Christ, dividing his best with the stranger, giving to each what he asks, braving the uttermost danger all for the enemy, man? Who can surrender till death, his words and his works, his house and his lands, his eyes and his heart and his breath? Who can surrender to Christ? Many have yearned toward it daily, yet they surrender to passion, wildly or grimly or gaily. Yet they surrender to pride, counting her precious and queenly. Yet they surrender to knowledge, preening their feathers serenely. Who can surrender to Christ? Where is the man so transcendent, so heated with love of his kind, so filled with the spirit resplendent that all of the hours of his day his song is thrilling and tender, and all of his thoughts to our white cause of peace surrender. 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 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Word of an Engineer by James Weldon Johnson Read for LibriVox.org by Daryl Nobles. She's built of steel from deck to keel and bolted strong and tight. In scorn she'll sail the fiercest gale and pierce the darkest night. The builder's art has proved each part throughout her breadth and length. Deep in the hulk of her mighty bulk, ten thousand titans' strength. The tempest howls, the ice wolf prowls, the winds they shift and veer. But calm I sleep, and faith I keep in the word of an engineer. Along the trail of the slender rail, the train like a nightmare flies, and dashes on through the black-mouthed yawn where the cavernous tunnel lies. Over the ridge, across the bridge, swung twixt the sky and hell, on an iron thread spun from the head of the man in a draughtman's cell. And so we ride over land and tide without a thought of fear. Man never had the faith in God that he has in an engineer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.